everybody and welcome back to another edition of the Physio Shooters Podcast. Today we have with us Dr. Aaron Horshig, a physiotherapist, SNC coach, a speaker, a writer, and if you're unfamiliar with the name, he's also the man behind the Squat U, Squat University. I'm not going to waste any more time, we're going to jump straight in, but if you're enjoying what we're putting out here at Physio Shooters, feel free to drop us a like, comment, uh, a follow, or a review on wherever you get your podcast from. It's always much appreciated. So, Aaron, look, that's enough from me. Why don't you take a couple minutes, tell the audience about yourself for those who are unfamiliar, and then we're going to jump on in and just just get cracking, just get talking. Let's do it. So first off, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, For those out there who don't know who I am, uh, I'm a physical therapist, physio, uh, with a deep background into weight training competitively uh, in the sport of weightlifting. Um, Let's see here. Went to... Uh, get my undergraduate degree at Truman State University, which is a small school in Northeast Missouri, where I started Olympic weightlifting competitively, and then went to get my doctorate of physical therapy at the University of Missouri, moved out to Kansas City directly after, and just started immersing myself into the sports physical therapy world. Spent eight years out there before then moving back to St. Louis, which is where I live right now with my wife. And basically, I tried to really tailor my practice in a little bit different way than most physical therapists. So I wanted to always be within the sports realm. I loved working with athletes, but I saw this very underdeserved area of the strength athlete, of the physical ther- of the uh, you know powerlifter, weightlifter, crossfitter, people actually speaking to strength athletes. And that's sort of where I wanted to build my niche. And uh, yeah, just sort of evolved that way. I started making content. Uh, after about five years of being a physical therapist. So I didn't just start making social media content. The second I got out of school, I knew there was a lot I still needed to learn. You know, once you get that degree, you're still, there's still a lot of learning to do. It's basically yeah. your degree to start learning. For yeah, the first yeah. Time, you know, your rookie days um, is just developing everything. Exactly. Yeah. You don't know what you don't know. So I hit the ground running hard and I would read every single piece of research that I could get my hands on people working 40, 50 hours a week, seeing athletes of all ages, all different backgrounds. And then in 2015, I decided to start speaking to the world basically. And that's when I started squat university. And basically a lot of people at the the start, they'd say, well, why, why this squat? Why squat university? Where did that come from? And basically it sort of dawned on me, there was this deja vu like scenario where I was seeing patients time and time again, from the eight year old soccer player to the professional NFL football player to the weekend warrior that loves running marathons. And time and time again, there was this deja vu like scenario where people were unable to perform the basic movements of an unloaded body weight squat. Needless to say, they couldn't even do a single leg squat on top of that. And I think, what I was seeing was that as a society, we have conceptually rearranged our priorities to think that the squat is more so an exercise ever before it's a movement, especially in our, you know, societies nowadays where we go to school all day, we go to work all day, we sit, the only time we squat maybe at the gym. And even then the amount of time we spend in the bottom of a squat is very small compared to maybe a a third world society where they're sitting in a deep squat to prepare food, or it's just a common thing throughout their life to be able to access that full movement. And I found that when we can rearrange those priorities and get back to the basics of moving well and regain this squat movement above all other movements, it sort of is that missing puzzle piece in our movement repertoire that I think unlocks the ability to do so many other things better with better movement quality, better technique, better performance with less risk of injury. Um, I loved when I was first learning about physical therapy and this sort of movement-based approach, um, the work of Gray Cook, you know, in his book, Movement. And in it, he wrote on what's called the performance pyramid. Basically, it's a way of looking at the body with three tiers. You have movement is the the first tier, the most uh, grand base that sets the rest of the pyramid up. And then there was, you know, strength and performance and then skill at the very top. And I really truly believe that the squat was one of those missing puzzle pieces within the base of that squat that so many people had been missing. And I found when you can fix that, when you can give someone back their mobility, their stability, their pelvic control, their core control, and then on top of that layer capacity, it does so many things. And it doesn't matter if you're a power lifter or a weight lifter. This is something for life. 
And I think when you can prioritize things that way, so many other things get better. So that's really where I started in 2015, speaking to the world. And ever since then, uh, not only do I work 40 hours a week as a treating clinician, but I'm also putting out content on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, uh, my own podcast. I just try to put out content every single day to help other people, uh, but speak in a way that they can understand. I know my role wasn't to speak to other physical therapists or that's not my intention. Um, you know, my, my intention is really to talk to the athlete and the coach in a way that they can understand and vernacular that they can understand, because that's who I was first and foremost ever became ever before I became a treating clinician is I was an athlete first, a coach first. So that's the words that I best, uh, relate to, and I can understand. So I saw at the time when I first got out, there's a lot of excellent, you know, physios, medical practitioners that are speaking to other people on that level but they're using jargon that most people don't connect with. You know, if you explain, well, you know, humeral flexion past 90 degrees is going to engage the serratus anterior to upwardly rotate the scapula, you just lost 90% of people out there. Now, if you're talking to another physical therapist and that's your goal, that's awesome. Great job. I wanted to speak to people in the way in which I wish someone had spoke to me when I was that 18 year old weightlifter and having shoulder pain. And I was so frustrated that I couldn't find anything out there that was relatable to me doing a push press over my head and my shoulder just hurts in the front and I don't know what to do. And I wanted to be that source of uh, help and empowerment for other people. And that's really where Squire University came from and I've been doing it ever since. Grand. I think one of the first things I want to touch on there, uh, what you said uh, almost at the beginning of once you get your degree, that's really just the first steps. My next intern that's starting with me this summer, he's a friend of mine and he's also now just studying PT at the same PT school that I did. He was saying to me like, look, you know, I'm just in my first year, but I kind of don't see how I'm supposed to be doing all of this within the next two years. And an old intern of mine was with me on Monday for an issue of his. And he was also saying like, ah, how am I going to be piecing all of this together in the space of a few months? And it is. Uh, and I know in the UK, that's the way they treat it. Once you graduate, you're a band five physio. And actually, you're essentially still under training for that whole first year or up until you hit that band six position, that mm. first year, first two years. And even after that, there's still so much to develop. And even I imagine now when you're... Or, or, almost 11 years into the game now Aaron and I as a, mm -hmm. as a physio mm -hmm. there's still stuff that you're you're learning there's still stuff that you're developing there's still things that you'll add into your repertoire strings to your bow so to speak and it's so important for people to realize that just because you got that piece of paper it don't mean squat uh, and it's very true what you want to do or what you wanted to do for lifters resonates with me is it's what I want to do with the MMA athlete with mm. the, the jiu-jitsu guys because I've had so many injuries when I was competing, when I was training, and I just didn't know jack about anything, didn't know why it was happening. It was only after six or seven different physios that I finally got a hamstring issue diagnosed and solved, and it was mind-blowing that it took so long. It's why I wanted to get into the game. And yeah, being able to put it into words that people understand, and when my teammates will ask me questions as to, hey, this is going on, what can I do? I get that feel good feeling and the listeners couldn't see it. But as soon as you mentioned talking about lifting, there's a big smile on your face and you light up when you do. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's that joy you get from being able to give back to people within that community that got you started. Now, coming back to the squat, it's one of the primal movements that you, you do literally do every day. And I was lucky enough to shadow at a, a rugby club in the UK, London Wasps, uh, back before I started physiotherapy. Um, one of the physios said to me there, before we let the guys back on the field, we check their primal movements, we check them lunging, we check them squatting, we check them doing that sort of stuff before we even get them running onto the field. If they can't even squat, then how the hell are they going to go play rugby with massive 80, 90 plus kilo guys who are trying to take their head off almost? Why is it Im important to get the smaller elements of the squat right as 
one of the things that you see now on social media is the fact that, hey, biomechanics don't matter. Don't worry if someone's not squatting right. If Barbara's uh, having a heavy knee valgus and she's got knee pain, ah, mm -hmm. forget about it. She's been having that knee valgus. You don't know how long it's been going on. That could have been there for 20 years. Could have been there for 20 minutes. Don't worry. Um, biomechanics isn't as important. Get them moving and that's, that's it. Oil it up. Lubricate yeah. the joint. What, why is it that it is important? And it, like I said to you before, and for me, it's probably a little bit of confirmation bias as I do work pretty biomechanically, the sort of McGill style of, of physio. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Biomechanics matter. <laughs> and they, they, the, the more weight that you're lifting, the more they matter. And, and the thing is, is that there's certain things that research fails to do well. And that is to look at things over a lifespan right? To, to really take in context as well. So for example, um, spine mechanics, I was, there was a, someone that was debating the idea of spinal flexion doesn't matter when lifting. It's okay to round your back when you deadlift. And they pointed to, to some research article and there's a systematic review done by O'Sullivan and some other people. It's called like, you know, when does lifting matter? Something like that with this flexed spine. And if you read the abstract, you're like, oh, wow, there's not a single study out there that shows that rounding your back when lifting something correlates well with pain. Yet, if you look at the studies that they actually did in their systematic review, did you know there's not a single study that the people lifting had a load over 12 kilos? So then all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow. So they're extrapolating this grand idea that spinal mechanics don't matter when lifting only because they looked at a bunch of studies of people lifting 12 kilos or less. That's all. How are you going to relate that? that so makes in the a same lot of way, sense. Yeah. Exactly. So in the same way, we, we see athletes who have knee valgus. And let's say even you followed them for eight weeks. Well, th maybe they don't have pain during that eight weeks. But does that mean that that's a bad mechanic? You can't justify and say that it's uh, an okay or an acceptable thing just because they don't develop pain in that eight weeks. Every single person is going to be different based on their capacity, the amount of load lifted, the frequency of load lifting, how long they've been lifting, everything like that. There's so many different things. So to just, just because the average of something may not come out and say that there's a significant difference does not mean as a whole the, the movement is, is good or bad. You have to be able to understand context and you have to, that's where the wisdom and experience comes in. Because let me tell you, I have seen plenty and plenty of athletes come to me who have knee pain, who have knee valgus. And yet when we correct it, all of a sudden they have no pain. I didn't do anything different. I just changed their mechanics up a little bit. Problem mechanics lead to pain over time. And the thing is, is that every single part of your body has a biological set tipping point of load at which it can tolerate. And every single person is going to be different. But the more frequently you lift, the more volume, the more intensity you have, the quicker you will reach that biological tipping point. Some people have bodies that can tolerate those problematic mechanics for longer before they reach that biological tipping point. But to say that you know, this elite lifter that shows knee valgus and doesn't have pain at this time is a justification for why everyone should be able to do, you know, this knee valgus is, is a complete horrible way of looking at the body in the way in which it adjusts to load in the way in which, uh, it performs. Um, and I really think the, the longer that you're in the game, the more you can really realize BS when you hear it of people saying that mechanics don't matter. Um, I truly think when it comes to uh, mechanics and people that say that it doesn't matter, there's usually three different things at play. First off, they're not the ones that do the research. And I actually had a really good uh, talk with Dr. Stuart Miguel about this. And basically he was like, all the people that he has seen that say justifications of like, well, research doesn't point to how low back pain is associated with biomechanical factors. They're just reading other people's research and they're looking at averages and means and things like that. They're not the ones that are actually testing spines or the ones that are in the arena doing the work and actually see the problems when they occur. Second thing, they usually often are not working with higher level athletes because these higher level athletes, again, if you have Susan, who's a 30-year-old, goes to the gym a couple of times and her knees cave in a little bit. And she goes to the gym once a week. 
that's very different than a competitive athlete who is lifting every single day and lifting tremendous loads. They're going to have totally different amounts of forces placed on their body and uh, are very sensitive to, to bigger changes like that. And then three, often they're not the, they haven't experienced these problems themselves as, as far as like, they're not the ones uh, lifting very heavy loads and they haven't experienced uh, the rigors of training. Because let me tell you, you would be very hard pressed to find a competitive weightlifter or power lifter that has been in the game for a long time that says that technique doesn't matter. Mechanics don't matter. I just had a chat with Ed Cohen, the greatest power lifter of all time. Yep. And he told me spine mechanics matter. Knee mechanics matter. The people that did not have good spine mechanics that left their back round, they didn't make it very long in the sport. They found injuries. So not only are we corroborating this from a scientific standpoint with work like from McGill and things like that, but we're seeing it from a practical standpoint from lifters who have been in the game a long time and have seen the detriments of what poor technique over time with bad load can do to the body. So I think movement matters. And I think when you can see it in real time, where if I can take an athlete who's been dealing with pain and change their mechanics all I'm doing with different cues or maybe a different exercise here or there and improve their mechanics and instantly it takes away their pain. It's justification time after time. And this isn't just like, oh, I did it with 20 athletes. I've been doing this myself for over a decade, time and time again, seeing you know athletes of all different ages and different levels where mechanical changes can not only take away pain, but then improve their performance and set them up for, for doing amazing, amazing things. So mechanics matter whether it's at the knee whether it's at the back but we have to have context and to make a blanket statement that it doesn't matter it's just not um it's, it's not honest it's not honest no. exactly just to play devil's advocate there you mentioned that when you had your chat with uh, Stuart mcgill that yes he said uh, for the first of the three people is the ones that are doing the testing they don't see the problems and they aren't in the arena testing however the papers do come out that mm -hmm. biomechanics aren't as important. So how do those things then then add up? Because um, you can't have both, right? Yes, here, here's, an, here's an explanation. So there was a research article by Dr. Stuart McGill where he was talking about the kettlebell swing and the amount of motion that was seen at the spine. And in the article, when you look at the description, it read that the average amount of uh, spinal motion ranged from like seven degrees of extension, 25 degrees of spinal flexion. And then automatically people will go, oh, well, if there's spinal flexion with a kettlebell swing, well, then clearly, you know, spinal flexion is not a bad thing. It's, it's going to happen. It's something that we can't avoid. Yet, when you look at that, that's clearly the average, meaning that where there were some people in the study that had a lot of motion, and there were some people in the, in the study that had very little motion. But what that study doesn't show at all is, well, at the time, those people that are doing kettlebell swings, how, um, how advanced were those people? How many of those people have trained under good coaches to teach them the proper that are cueing for a kettlebell swing? It just says, well, men ages 18 to 25 who are active individuals, right? That's how studies work. They don't say these are uh, all elite kettlebell athletes you know, that have at least 10 years of experience and no history of back pain. They say, well, right now they have no pain. So you have to look at all these small little things within the research to give you an understanding of, well, were the athletes, some of them maybe just weren't very trained in how to brace themselves. And even then they're doing a kettlebell swing. Is that the same thing is, is to say, well, because there was some spinal flexion with a kettlebell swing of lightweight, is that justification to say that we should be able to pick up 200 kilos off the ground and allow back flexion? Because there's no study that's going to get approved that's going to say, I want to take these people and I want you all to lift this really heavy weight. And some of you people, I want you to round your back, let it move. And then the other people pick it up with good technique. There's no one that's going to actually approve that study. So we have to understand the context of what we do in real life and how that changes things. So then what would your advice be there with spinal flexion, spinal loading, when mm -hmm. lifting, whether it's the squat, whether it's the deadlift, whether it's the clean and jerk, what have you, the snatch? Mm -hmm. I think the big thing is, is context matters. And if you want spinal flexion, spinal flexion is not a bad thing, but it, we have to understand load. A yogi 
who is bending their body in different ways does so under very low load. And if you want to do a cat camel or a cat cow exercise, that's moving your spine. There's no problem with that. It's very low load. But the more weight that you are lifting, the more we want to limit spinal flexion because there's a lot of research that shows that it's the combination of load plus movement that leads to a breakdown in spine. So that's where we really want to take it is that whenever you're lifting, spinal mechanics matter. And the more you are lifting, the more those mechanics matter. That's going to be more so load dependent. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you want to do with the spine then? Are you entirely bracing and no movement? Are you shifting into more extension? Are you, how are you then doing that? So first off, we have to understand sort of the neutral posture is a range. It's not one set environment. And the idea is that we're trying to limit movement. Are we going to keep it 100% still? No, but we're trying to limit the motion about that. Now, the type of spinal posture that you assume is going to be dependent on also the lift that you're performing. For example, an uh, Olympic weightlifter that is performing a clean or a snatch will often uh, assume a slightly extended posture because not only do they have to lift the weight to the hips, but also they have to perform the full motion of the clean or the snatch. So the bar has to go overhead or to the shoulders. Whereas with a deadlift, the goal is only to move the bar to the hips. So for some people, uh, for example, they can maintain a slight, slight curvature of the spine, but lock it in place and try to move mostly about the hips. And when that happens, again, we have very high load, but we're limiting spinal movement. So the way in which Dr. McGill explains this is that the spine sort of works by this equation of developing power and uh, or spinal injury usually comes with power. So if you have power equals force times velocity. So if I'm, let's say, a golfer and I'm swinging the golf club extremely fast, well, the golf club doesn't weigh much at all. So I'm having a lot of velocity uh, created at the spine, but with very low force. So when that happens, the power is kept overall load. But if I were to take a 30 pound golf club and start swinging it, obviously then I'm going to raise the power and therefore increase my risk of injury at the spine. Well, the same thing happens with a deadlift. Let's say I'm trying to deadlift uh, 200 kilos. Well, if I deadlift 200 kilos and try to brace sufficiently and limit the amount of spinal motion that's occurring, power is going to be kept at a relatively lower position than if I was to allow my back to continuously round and flex off the floor. So then you have force and you have velocity because every time the spine moves, you have velocity. Therefore you would increase power and then injury risk would increase as well. So often if you are able to keep power uh, derived at the spine low, you're able to mitigate a lot of injury uh, within the spine. It's when you mix the two that you often find problems. Okay. And by bracing the spine, do you mean a Valsalva-esque movement there? when it when it is a heavy load yes okay yes a, st a sufficient stability is what uh dr stewart mcgill would explain it and, and the way it would go is you know if i'm bending over to pick up 100 kilos from the ground i need a sufficient amount of stability in my spine in order to limit that motion but the more load i'm lifting the more i need to maintain that stiffness so it will require more and more stiffening of the spine more and more bracing of the core muscles in that valsalva maneuver will need to get more and more intense yeah and it's also something that i think people do inherently as well uh that valsalva maneuver when you see someone go to lift something up heavy they automatically go oh and then they're gonna lift it up whether they're lifting a heavy suitcase off of the the what you call it at the airport or if they're going to lift weights and one of my pt clients mentioned it as well now he did it without thinking about it and then he said to me afterwards sonny i can't help it but every time every time we do it i have to hold my breath and i'm like yeah what's your problem like uh there's you know he's like i, I want to stop doing that I'm like, no <laughs> no you don't uh, it's it's a good thing that you're doing it i've not said anything about it because i i want you to do it and if you're doing it yourself that for me is even better because mm -hmm. it it is it, it again it's more of a primal thing it's more of something that we do even when we're kids when we're lifting up something heavy when you see a little kid trying to carry something with their parents because they're a big strong little kid and they're going to do yeah you see them puff up their cheeks because they're trying to brace their body <laughs> exactly um, let's let's bring it back a little lower down the chain let's come down to the knees better yet 
let's start from the ground up. Can you talk us through the tripod in the foot and yeah. what exactly that means and why that's important? Yeah. So the tripod foot is a way of looking at foot stability, where if you were to take your shoes off and look at your foot, you have three points, the base of your heel, the base of your first toe and the base of your fifth toe. And ideally, when you're performing a movement like a squat or a deadlift, you want equal balance across all three of those points. And unfortunately, uh, you'll often get these incorrect or suboptimal cues of weight in the heels. Now, obviously, every cue is going to be dependent on whether or not it's a good cue is whether or not it brings out the desired outcome. But I think too often what we know is that athletes take cues and they run with them. So what happens is that uh, a coach may give them the cue of weight in their heels all the time and find out that almost 90% of their weight is in their heels. They have, their toes can flop around like crazy because they don't have a balanced foot. And when you assume a more balanced foot, it's just like that foundation grows like crazy and allows you to move much more efficiently. So the tripod foot is, is one of the most uh, important things that most people don't realize because they're always wearing shoes. So they cover up their proprioception, their ability to feel the ground and feel for whether or not they're even balanced in the first place. So in clinic, when I'm teaching people to squat, one of the first things I do is take their shoes off. I rarely have people walk around the clinic in sh with shoes on because the way in which we often wear shoes is completely hindering our body's ability to sense position, it sense balance, and also pushes our feet into very, very poor positions. Um, I would urge anyone listening to highly recommend um, looking up Dr. Ray McClanahan who's the inventor of Correctos and all of the work that he does in teaching people about how uh, foot issues often stem from the shoes that we wear and how bad they are for our feet and how they push our foot into a poor position. And again, people say, well, technique doesn't matter and posture doesn't matter. We'll just look at how the posture of our foot and the way in which it is uh, molding and adapting our feet into an unnatural position affects so many things. Uh, bunions or hallux valgus to the physio is one of the most common problems that we see in people nowadays. And it's all related, not to your genetics, but to the shoes that you wear that smash your toes together into an unnatural position. And yet that leads to so many other issues in the foot and up the rest of the chain because of the way it affects foot stability. So posture matters. We just have to understand context of it. Once you hit that tripod position, is there anything else that happens further up the chain to the to yeah. the rest of the body or something that should be happening further up the body? So if we look at the tripod foot, if everything is balanced over that foot, it's going to allow the ankle to move well and the knee to remain in line. So if you see people that are uh, showing that common dreaded knee valgus or the knee caving in, so many times they'll get the cue, we'll just drive the knees wide or you need to strengthen your glute medius, things like that. And they often forget oh, it's all stemming from the feet often. And you can do as much glute work as you want. You can give as much cueing to drive the knees wide as you want. But if you're never stabilizing the foot and maintaining it in its anatomically aligned position, that knee will always lose its stability. The way I love to look at the body is through uh, the very simple to easy to understand way of the joint by joint approach that uh, Mike Boyle and Greg Cook described in their book, Movement. And it's a very simple way for those out there that are listening that have not heard of it before. Basically, it's a way of understanding that the different body parts uh, all have a connection and a role to play for this optimal alignment and movement. Your foot should be stable. It's inherently a very mobile structure, but when we're moving, we want it to become instantly stable to provide a platform for the rest of the body. The ankle should be mobile. It has a tendency to become stiff, and when it does, it hinders motion. The knee should be stable. It should be able to maintain it in optimal alignment with the rest of our body, but it has a tendency to become sloppy and cave around and, and move in and out, you know, and on up the rest of the body. So it's mobile platforms moving on top of stable platforms. Um, so once you align that foot and that optimal stability, everything else up the rest of the chain usually moves into a much better position. Where do you stand on knees over toes? The knees can definitely go over the toes it all depends on when it happens. So, and whether or not you're staying balanced. So again, let's, let's go back to this cue because this is, is something that a lot of people misunderstand. I think the cue, don't let your knees pass your toes, was probably rooted with good intention. It was probably a physio or a doctor that was seeing someone with knee pain and they said, don't let your knees pass your toes. 
And then the person squatted again, all of a sudden they had no knee pain. So I said, aha, we fixed the problem. It was the knees over toes that was the problem. But yet, was it really fixing the problem or were you just manipulating torque and teaching them how to better balance themselves? You see, in order to perform a deep squat, the main cardinal rule is that your body weight, your center of gravity must remain over the middle of your foot. And in order for someone to squat deep, in order for that to maintain that center of gravity over midfoot, in some people, their knees must go over their toes. And if not, your chest is going to have to collapse forward. So it would move the body into a less efficient biomechanical position, specifically for lifting. The knees have to go forward in some people. It all depends on when. If the knees drive forward at the very start of the squat, sometimes that can lead to people becoming off balance and shifting forward. Yet if you start in a balanced position and the hips drive back just a little bit, you hinge, then you drive straight down, those knees will have to go forward in some people. And it's not a bad issue at all. If knees over toes was a problem, there are millions and millions of weightlifters all, the world, all around the world that need to be told this this second because they're in big trouble and they're going to have knee replacements tomorrow. And that's just simply not the case. Yeah. Um, it's all about when and not if. Okay. Yeah. I mean, one of the big things there for me that uh, really opened my eyes on, on that one, one of my lecturers once said, if you can't go knees over toes, just try walking down the stairs and see what happens because you're yeah, never going to exactly. get down the stairs otherwise. Um, I, I think what you said there makes a lot of sense and it probably came out of good intentions, probably came out of someone who had a little bit of knee pain. Don't push it over. Manipulate the torque, make it more hamstring, make it more hip dominant mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, yeah, it changes the feel. Uh, I've worked with a lot of ACL patients who just by shifting that weight a little bit, just by making it the, the torque a little bit different, shifting it more into the hips, into the hammies, into the glutes, all of a sudden the movement gets easier. One of the things I immediately say to them afterwards is, listen, I'm not trying to say to you, you can never go with your knees over your toes. Do not take that away from me here or else I've done you a disservice and it's going to be a poor reflection of me. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> but it's just for now, you need to adjust the way that you're loading and then later on when the knee is feeling better all of a sudden you'll be doing it without thinking and your knees are going to go over your toes no problem now you mentioned there with a deep squat seen as we're already there mm -hmm. i have my opinions on the deep squat and i'll say them now is if it's relevant for the sport that you're doing or if there's some kind of functional relevance otherwise it's not uh, it's not a must for me if I've got my PT clients or whatever. I don't necessarily need to see them going past that 90-90. I won't stop them at the 90-90 and say, don't go deeper. But I also won't say to them, listen, I need you to go arse to grass on that squat. Where do you stand on arse to grass, on deep squats? Is there much to it? Or are the naysayers justified? Or where, where do you stand on it? So I think, again, we have to have a discussion on context because it's something that a lot of people like to paint a black and white photo and if there's just a lot more to it. So, for example, first and foremost, let's have the discussion on sport. A power lifter does not need to squat as to grass. In competition, they have to squat with their hip really crease below the tops of their knees. A weightlifter, an Olympic weightlifter, should probably squat as to grass. If they don't, they're not strengthening the capacity to catch a clean or a snatch in a very deep, efficient position to uh, increase the potential load that they can handle in those two lifts. Outside of those two sports, usually what I tell people is I want you to have, first and foremost, the ability to squat as deep as possible without load, just movement wise. I want you to squat as deep as possible with maintaining proper knee alignment without letting your back round over like crazy. I want you to show a good looking deep body weight squat because the squat is first and foremost a movement before it's an exercise. So I want you to be able to squat as deep as possible body weight to show that you have optimal foot stability, good ankle mobility, sufficient hip mobility, excellent core and pelvic control. And those are things why the, the deep squat is a movement screen is because we're not looking to 
necessarily load you up that deep, but I want to see if you have that capability, because if you're missing that, there's probably something else that we need to work on. Now, will some people not have that ability? Sure. I saw a guy the other day, he has extremely deep hip sockets, a lot of Merle retroversion, and he just, he can't get much past 90. His anatomy just will not allow him. Now that doesn't mean we're not going to try to work on mobility as much as possible, but some people, because of the anatomical changes that they go through and the way they've lived their life, uh, will have these adaptations that will maybe not allow an extremely deep squat. But I think that is the rarity. I think most people have that capability. They just lose it. It's one of those things. If you don't use it, you lose it. So I think first and foremost, the ability to perform a full depth squat body weight should be something that we should all do and we should all maintain. When it comes to training, I truly believe unless you are in a sport that requires a partial depth squat, like a, like a power lifter, I truly believe you should squat as deep as possible without movement breakdown, without technique breakdown and without pain. So I'll give you an example. If I have a soccer player that can squat to full depth all the way down as to grass, I would rather him strengthen his body through that full range of motion capacity than have him just stop at 90 degrees. I believe if he has the full capability, he should, with good technique and without pain, he should train that full capability to strengthen and improve his capacity through the ranges that his body has. If someone does not have that capability, I want them just to go to that point. I don't want them to ever push into a position just for the sake of going deeper if it's going to compromise their technique. Because again, going back to the start of our discussion, movement breakdown out of that ideal alignment under load predisposes someone to eventual injury. This is sort of the movement-based profession of what you know physical therapy, physiotherapy stands upon is that we are movement experts and under load out of ideal alignment, whether that's the knees or the back, that's how you eventually increase risk of injury. So if someone was to try to squat deep just to be like, well, my coach says I got to go last to grass, but then at the bottom, they get this huge butt wink, their knees cave in. It's not worth it. So I would not have you go that deep. Maybe we need to work on some things, but I don't want you to push into poor technique. Same thing with pain. Let's say someone has knee pain when they go last to grass. Well, I don't want you to go that deep if it's going to push through pain. Now, it doesn't mean we just ignore it and just box squat all day to 90 degrees, but I want you to understand that pushing through pain is only a disaster, a recipe for more future injury and more disaster. So um, I think there's the idea floating around social media again that, you know, just 90 degree squats are the most optimal for power and strength. And Really, I, I don't have a problem with squatting higher if that's, I mean, some people like to do uh, quarter squats because they saw a research article maybe that showed that those who are working on quarter squats can get improved vertical jump. I understand the specificity of it, but in my opinion, the squat is first and foremost a movement that we want to be able to take as natural as possible to as deep of a position as possible. Use your body as it was designed. And then when it comes to the loading, I want to make sure you can do it well, and I want you to squat to as deep as you can perform it well with good technique. And that's going to be a little bit different for every single person. But technique quality is the overall most important thing when it comes to a loaded movement. Interesting. Interesting. Is there ever a time where you can see for an athlete that that carryover may not necessarily be there so it might not be worth doing the ass to grass squat for them for their sport if their sport doesn't require uh that range of motion for that power build up so if we take uh a, an MMA guy for example mm -hmm. and then uh, a football soccer football uh, player now for me the MMA guy will make use of it when they're in those grappling positions, when they're down on all fours, they're going to need that power. They're going to need the strength to come out of that position uh, at the bottom. If uh, if another guy's on top, they're on all fours trying to power out of that. But with the, the football, soccer athlete, they're not necessarily going to need that for their sport. Um, so I appreciate what you said of, listen, if they've already got that range of motion and what you said right at the beginning and what you said not a minute ago was, we want to maintain that is it not still possible for them to maintain that outside of underweight 
um, under weight loads and just maintain that through general movement through their general warm-up prep for other stuff or even their warm-up for lifting and then would time not be better spent at different stages or does it not matter i i guess the question first and foremost has to be is the deep loaded squat something that every single person needs to train for their sport I would say, you know, this points to also like Mike Boyle and a lot of his work that he does with hockey players and, and uh, court and field athletes rather than just a weightlifter. I think the squat, like you said, first and foremost, it's a movement. So I think you need to be able to maintain that full depth position. Uh, does everyone need to do a loaded barbell squat? I think that's the biggest thing that most people um, misunderstand is that the squat is not just something you do with the bar on your back. It could be something where the bar's on your front, or maybe it's a kettlebell or a loaded sandbag. But I, I think the movement of the squat, improving your capacity to control your body in and out of those extreme ranges is something that could you know, benefit so many people. And when it comes to sports specificity, I think we also have to understand that it can't be a yes or no kind of thing because there's so many other things an athlete does. When an athlete goes into training for soccer, they just don't go in and do one exercise. They go in and they may have like 10 exercises or four to five exercises that they're doing in that training period. <clears throat> so while they come in and let's say their goal is to go heavy to push weight with a particular exercise, maybe like a Bulgarian split squat or maybe a, an RDL, something like that. It's a hinge motion, not very deep. Well, I would, in my opinion, still recommend that that athlete has that ability to load their body through as deep of a range in a bilateral squat as possible. It doesn't mean that they have to back squat 400 pounds to ask to grass, but I would like to see them improve their capacity in a double leg position because that is setting the foundation for a jump, for a land. It's, it's one of those, obviously, the fundamental movements. So why would we not want to still improve their capacity within that motion? And then it doesn't have to be a barbell back squat, but it could be anything that loads the body through that range of motion, knowing that it's only a fraction of what they're training. And they're probably going to get more bang for their buck to become a better soccer player with other movements. But I still think to become a more robust human, I think it is necessary to still load the body with good technique through that range of motion. There's only very few sort of fundamental movements we have carries we have uh hinges we have uh, squats and I, I think still finding those those movements and using them with good technique and, and loading and improving our capacity is something that just benefits us as a human more so than just you know athletic training fair i'll take that i'll take that uh and then just following back further up the chain uh you mentioned already deep hip sockets and and the butt wink mm -hmm. um what effect do those sorts of things have for things like the squat or the deadlift or for someone's general movement? And then could you maybe explain to us how we as physios might be able to assess something like uh, someone's hip socket and why that needs to be of importance to us? Mm -hmm. So the reason that butt wink is important to understand is because the idea is that when you're going into a deep squat, if the pelvis turns under the body, what's happening at the low back? If the pelvis moves, the lumbar spine, specifically that L4, L5, L5, S1 joints are going to be flexed as well. And again, under load with flexion is something that has been shown time after time in research to be a predisposing uh, risk factor for eventual disc herniation. And those are the, the joints at which we see the most disc herniations appear. And it's that movement under load, again, creating power at a very specific segment, not a general rounding of the spine, but a very point specific and isolated flexion of one or two joints. So the idea is that long term, that is a risk factor that could increase your risk for injury. Now, again, if you were to take a study and show 50 weightlifters and follow them for a couple weeks, likely that's going to give you a very bad idea of whether or not long term but when is going to cause an injury, because again, everyone's got different capacity levels. We're talking about long-term risk factors, not something that's going to tear, uh, tear an annulus in your disc all of a sudden, because the injuries that we sustain 
uh, under load as weightlifters, powerlifters, and crossfitters, the acute injury rate is very low. It's not a very, uh, you know, traumatic injury type of sport. It's not a torn ACL, things like that. It's usually the slow building injuries that occur over time because it's repetition, volume, loading, all that taken together to where we are reaching someone's tipping point for biological set tipping point that everyone's a little bit different. But we are able to use research to understand that the mechanism still remains the same. So we want to limit those mechanisms for longevity purposes. So in the same way in which someone lifting a heavy load off the ground may not create an injury right now, I don't want someone, it would be extremely horrible of myself to say, hey, just let your spine round every single time you lift the bar off the ground. Long term, you'll be fine. Well, the same thing goes for butt wing. The more motion that's occurring there under load, you're just increasing that risk of injury. So ideally, I would like to do things that limits that movement under load. Teaching the person, educating them, be like, hey, this isn't something that you should be scared about right now. This isn't something that you should freak out. Oh, there's butt wake. You're going to blow a disc right now. That's not what we're saying. But we're educating you that it's over time, this is something that could lead to an increased risk of injury. And if our goal as practitioners is to create something that not only gets you strong in the short term, but also has that longevity with it, that's where everything comes together. That's what we're trying to promote is strong, healthy, educated athletes and people. So with the butt wink, what comes into it? Well, we have to understand hip sockets because someone who has a more shallow hip socket will allow that femur to rotate within the socket uh, much into much greater flexion. Um, whereas someone with a deeper hip uh, socket, that femur is going to hit sort of that end range much sooner. So either you have two options, you're going to impinge upon yourself or your body's going to move into more hip flexion uh, because of the movement of the pelvis. So actually there's a, some interesting research that sort of looks at the epidemiological uh, status of uh, hip dysplasia across the world. And they found that there are certain areas that have uh, very shallow hip sockets, more uh, issues are uh, with hip dysplasia and then some areas in the world that have very deep hip sockets. So the lowest incidence of hip dysplasia. And uh, Stuart McGill nicknamed it the Celtic hip because he found that a lot of people uh, in that uh, uh, Western part of Europe found that they had very deep hip sockets yet the parts of the world, the, uh, the Eastern European countries, Bulgaria, things like that actually had some of the most shallow hip sockets. And yet that's a, the part of the world where we find some of the best weightlifters uh, mm. come from, which is an interesting fact because weightlifting, obviously you have to be able to catch a squat and clean in the most deep position possible. So could it be something that inherently there's maybe some genetic traits that allows some people to have great hips for a specific type of sport? It's interesting to think about, but um, Don't know obviously, if you've ever seen the the Slavic squat memes where fellas are sitting in the tracksuits <laughs> in the deep squat position? Yeah, there might exactly. Be something to that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, uh, as far as how to assess uh, hip socket depth, the most easy way is just to put someone on their back and just passively take their thigh and move it towards their chest and see how far up you can go before you start to hit sort of a, a hard block. Um, in, in whether or not that back moves. And I've seen some people, I mean, if I'm moving their hip around passively, I get up just above 90 degrees and it's, it's like a hard block. It's not a soft tissue block, like a hamstring stretch. Like they just don't go any further. Whereas like for me, I'm able to literally touch my, my knee to my chest all the way down. And I don't feel anything, which is also why I'm able to sit in a very deep squat, um, without any assistance in like a heel lift. Okay. What would you say if it was someone who you've assessed previously, um, you've been able to take their femur, take their, their thigh, move it into hip flexion, and they've come to you for a, a new issue, and all of a sudden that's now you're getting that, that block. When you're going into the endo rotations, you're now going into the the hip flexion and all of a sudden now there's a block that wasn't there when you saw them last time. What mm -hmm. what could that potentially be down for? 
so we, we could potentially say that maybe we're having some some fault within the hip joint in the way in which it's moving. And so we're impinging upon ourselves. So we'd get that positive Fadir test. Um, I think that could be due to a number of different things in way how the, the actual femur is sitting within the hip socket. There's some people that believes it's more uh, capsular stiffness. Some people believe it, it could be more so due to the way in which uh, the femur is sitting because of soft tissue um, under facilitation and over facilitation within the body, maybe the glutes aren't activating as well as they could. We're very over dominant in our TFL and anterior hip structures. Um, but either way, we've got that, that stiffness in that, that block sensation. Um, usually my first go-to in that particular situation is to try like a banded joint mobilization to help not only, uh, regain some of that motion within the hip socket joint, uh, but then also have that neuromuscular re-education component where we're driving the knee out to the side, squeezing the glutes, getting them to turn on and pull that femur back into a more centralized position and then open up that body. And then that's again, where that test retest comes in to really allow us to, to see, you know, Hey, is this something that's actually making a legitimate change? Yeah. So it, it's trying to get the, the head of the femur to re-centralize within the joint is what your aim is if yeah. you're thinking that that's the, the cause of it, of course. Exactly, exactly. And again, that's where that uh, the test and retest comes in. I, I see a lot of people that have that hip impingement. I, I think just like the shoulder, you know, I've, the shoulder joint is is a very similar as where is the, you know, the humerus ideally is should be sitting a little bit more in the center of that socket. But if you have these imbalances within the, the joint structure, that's going to lead it to move a little bit more anterior whenever you're moving your arm overhead in the amount of, of problems that can occur with that same thing with the hip socket. Okay. Interesting. And then you mentioned also during your explanation with the butt wink that then goes further up into the lumbar spine. Discs don't slip. <laughs> Let's get that out. <laughs> uh, you know. yes. But what about disc herniations? Uh, everyone listening to this should know that MRIs don't tell you the whole story. Everyone's mm -hmm. got herniations. Uh, you could scan a thousand people and you'd probably get a thousand different results. There's, like you said earlier as well, there's no one posture. We're working between goalposts. Mm -hmm. What are the issues that we could potentially come across with a loaded movement uh, for the spine? How much issue should we take when there is a herniation um, if it's fresh? Uh, mm -hmm. Because like I just said, everyone's going to have something. Um, yeah. Where do we go with that? Yeah. So I think this sort of stems into how do we actually approach back pain and whether or not uh, we're treating the movement or are we treating uh, what we believe to be at fault? And this, again, was a big revelation for me in my career as well. You know, when you're when you come up through physio school and you're told, all right, well, this is a disc herniation. This is an end plate fracture. This is a facet joint irritation. So you're so enamored on understanding the anatomy and what's going wrong. But then you read different articles and they're like, well, of all these people that were asymptomatic and had no back pain, well, when they were scanned, 30 percent of 30 year olds had an abnormal scan. They had a disc herniation or a flattened disc. Well, then does that mean that disc bulges aren't a problem? And in reality, what I think it tells us to do is treat the movement, treat the person, not the, not the image, understand the, the pathomechanics, understand how disc bulges are created, understand what that does to the person, but treat the movement, understand, is this person flexion intolerant? under load because then right there that's often something that is disc related but i don't need to know if that person has a disc bulge via their mri to be able to get them out of pain and build back capacity i understand their movement problem so if i had someone that came to me and i didn't have a scan of them at all and they explained to me well i have pain in the bottom of my squat and i watched them squat and their pain only occurs when they have disc or have that uh, butt wing. And I see the problematic movement. It's flexion under load. And I say, all right, well, let's squat, but let's not go that deep. Let's just box squat to like an 18 inch box. What happens? Oh, I don't have any pain. Okay, that's one test. Let's go to another test. Let's maybe try to pick up this weight off the ground. Now, this time I want you to small weight. Let's let your back round under load. Do you have pain? Yes. Okay, now I want you to hinge properly. Try to maintain your spine in neutral position, then pick up this weight. What happens? 
Well, you have no pain. Okay, well, there's another sign. And you just go through all these different tests. And there's no set protocol. There's a number of different tests that people like to do. But with a proper evaluation and a proper screening regimen, we can weed out and determine what are someone's movement-based triggers based on posture, movements, and loads that create pain or make things better. And in that case, I may be able to find out this person has a flexion with load intolerance. And this is how I'm going to treat them. I'm going to first teach them, hey, this is why you have pain. Because so many people just say, all right, well, you have this uh, is your problem. Here's a bunch of exercise. And they are never educated about, all right, it's the movement of flexion under load, because you can see if I can keep you in more of a neutral posture, you have less pain. This means that when you pick up laundry off the floor or a child off the ground, I want you to try to maintain this position for right now so that we can improve your resiliency and decrease your symptoms. So then over time, once this disc bulge heals and stiffens a little bit, because it will happen, you know, research articles show and plenty of science to back up that disc bulges usually will heal themselves in a matter of time. But that doesn't mean that the problem is just solved. So it's just waited out. It means right now we can do things to become more proactive, to decrease your symptoms and wind down the sensitivity of your body so that eventually when we build back your capacity to handle better loads, if you do round your spine a little bit, it's not going to trigger your symptoms like it does now. Now, is it interesting to know whether or not there is an active disc bulge on MRI? Sure. It's interesting to see. I like seeing them sometimes, but it doesn't change my treatment plan at all. Because if I have a good enough movement-based evaluation, again, understanding what triggers someone's pain based on movements, postures, and loads, I can formulate a specific treatment program to help get them out of pain and build back capacity. And that's, again, all comes back to the beginning part of the treatment or of our podcast today. People who say mechanics don't matter. I personally don't know as a physio, what are you doing with patients? I don't know what, you know what I'm saying? If someone comes to you with pain, your goal as a physical therapist is to understand, hey, this hurts. Here's how I can improve your movement quality so that you can address these movement imbalances to get out of pain and then improve your capacity to move in a way that's going to allow you to have better uh, movement quality and less pain, improve performance. That's what we do as a profession. So I don't know, maybe you're just talking to people about, about their pain, which in that case, you're a therapist, you're a, you're a counselor, you're not a physical therapist, you're not a physio, that's how we treat. Yeah, I absolutely do, um, like you mentioned there, uh, recovery with bulges through natural history is absolutely a thing, but we can help to exactly. make life more comfortable during that journey. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, uh, for myself at least, the biopsychosocial model does play a role in it uh, for me in communicating with my patient and like you said there giving them the education as to hey look this is what's going on for now so Mm -hmm. we want to make these adjustments for now this isn't the rest of your life Uh, important emphasis there because I still get patients and thankfully it, it, it tends to be older patients that say this when they come through I don't see a lot of younger patients using this phrase but I was told not to do this by my physio, uh, so I haven't done X movement in X amount of years or what have you. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't think that's necessarily because someone was a bad physiotherapist. I just think that we've learned a little bit more about communication as to making sure that when we say, yeah, man, when we say certain things, it doesn't mean forever. I was told by a physio uh, not to run and I took that to mean forever. (laughs) So I decided to go from being a cross-country athlete to doing MMA because I was told, Mm -hmm. oh, you can't run. (laughs) Great. So now I'm going to go get punched in the face for fun. This is uh, this is great. Um, But further down the line, I realized, oh, oh, she just meant for this brief period of time while it was recovering that part of the communication was missing two things I want to touch on. One Mm -hmm. is where does the biopsychosocial model fit in for you? Uh, we're there now so we may as well pump on for that and then the next bit was uh, whether you uh, or how you can find out if someone's a flexion responder or extension responder but we're there now Uh, I just finished my spiel on it Um, biopsychosocial model where does that fit in for you 
do you utilize it or where do you yeah i i think the idea it all comes down to communication and understanding that if you are educating someone correctly on the mechanism of how they got injured in what this is going to mean as far as how what you're trying to do is going to relate to them getting out of pain and what it means to their longevity. I think that's where it all comes down to. I, I think for a long time, like you mentioned, people, we weren't very good communicators. We weren't very good at empowering people to take hold of and understand their injury and where it's going to go and, and be like uh, people for so long would be like, Oh, uh, don't let your knees pass your toes. Well, why? Well, just don't do it. It's bad for your knees. Well, of course, that person is going to develop a fear around knees passing their toes. You know, if I say, you know, so many people like before, don't don't round your back ever. Well, is that really a long term solution? You have to be able to round your back sometimes like you're human bend over to tie your toes. It's the education. And I think the more in which we can communicate to our patients and explain the injury mechanism and how this is going to affect them in the short term and how things are going to affect them in the long term, that's really where you're going to get the best outcome. So I think that's where the bipsychosocial model comes in is understanding, you know, the psychology and how, you know, explaining things um, and empowering people can lead to better outcomes long term. My only issue with the way in which some people tout the bicycle social model is that they don't, I, I think it's almost like they just completely throw out biomechanics and they just completely hang their hat on the idea based on a few of these studies. Again, that, like I alluded to at the start where, oh, well, there's a systematic review that, you know, lumbar spinal mechanics don't matter when lifting. So then we're never going to assess someone with their mechanics and things like that. And I think it, it all has to fit together. You have to put it all together if you're trying to get the best outcomes long-term. And it ha my entire basis of how I treat patients stems from proper biomechanical valuation, but then also I have everything else that goes along with I'm talking to a person. I'm not talking to a machine. I have to understand you know, everything that they're bringing to the plate and everything that they're trying to get out of this and their fears and concerns with it. And I think if you educate someone and if you can speak to someone about everything that's going on, you're going to get the best outcomes long-term. And that's really what we're trying to do as, as treating clinicians. I'm with you there. And then how can we go about ascertaining if someone's a flexion responder or an extension responder or what's, yeah, what, what can we do? And what does that mean treatment wise as well? Mm -hmm. I think, I think yeah, I, again, it all comes down to, to a proper evaluation um, and understanding, again, loads, postures, and in, uh, in movements. And I would highly recommend people pick up uh, books like Back Mechanic from, from Stuart McGill or Dr. Uh, Shirley Saruman's work um, in Diagnosis and Movement. Um, and it's just understanding that our goal with our evaluation is to tease out what things trigger pain what things bring out symptoms and what things do not. And sure, you could have someone that could be both flexion and extension intolerant, depending on their, uh, their presentation. But I think with a very specific uh, testing protocol, you can really determine whether or not someone has a true flexion related uh, problem, whether or not maybe they have just a pure load related issue. For example, I see power lifters that are just purely load intolerant. You know, they are able to bend and extend their spine, but you get over hundred kilos on their back and they're going to have pain because that's more so related. Again, if we want to get into the pathophysiology of it, maybe to an end plate fracture because they loaded too frequently, too often, and didn't allow their body to take a step back and properly adapt to the loading pattern. So the end plate is a very uh, unique part of the spine, which requires that adaptation to sort of uh, harden and gristle over time to, to maintain uh, sufficient uh, load tolerance, and which is why sometimes you will see there's a research article where they did a, a CT scan on this world-class power lifter, and he had the most bone density out of ever that that had ever been ever seen on on ct before when it's because the loading over time was allowing his body to to adapt and become hardened to maintain uh structural in, integrity under load so again it all comes down to proper evaluation to see what you find and then based on that then we understand first and foremost the education again coming down let's say you have someone that's flexion intolerant well the first thing is teaching them how to move in a way that doesn't push into flexion so it may be teaching someone, hey, instead of rounding your back to put your shoes on, let's kneel. 
instead of, you know, grabbing that gallon of milk out of the, out of the fridge, instead of rounding your back, let's maybe push your hand into your thigh and hinge your hips. That way we try to maintain a little bit more of a neutral spine in, in clinic, sort of the, the movement education, I think is some of the most important things. Cause I could give someone a thousand corrective exercises, but if I don't teach them how to move a little bit differently in the 90% of the day that I'm not seeing them, it's easy to uh, continue and prolong symptoms and they're not going to get that optimal healing. What you were talking about there with just to come back to the end plate stuff. Yeah. I'm not entirely familiar with everything that happened with it medically, but is that also not what happened with Ronnie Coleman where he ended up having to go through X amount of surgeries as well with, with the back and the legs and everything? I, I can't speak specifically to Ronnie's case because I'm not as familiar with it, but I will say this. I know Ronnie probably had a number of small injuries dating back to when he was in high school. I remember listening to his podcast with Joe Rogan and they were not uh, managed properly. He was yeah. not gone. He was not uh, sent to a physical therapist that gave him, uh, you know, education. And, like I believe he literally said that in one day he was squatting like over 500 pounds. He felt a pop and it hurt so bad. He couldn't walk for a couple of days. And then finally his pain went away and he just went right back to the gym and kept on training. Yeah. Like beast. The other but... yeah, I mean, the, no doubt the man was, you know, a beast in the gym. And that's the thing is athletes love lifting. They're going to lift heavy. And it's our job to give them education as to how to manage these small problems when they do come up. Cause they will, there's not a single person that goes throughout their training career and doesn't have a small injury, but when you manage them, well, they maintain their small nature and they only maybe take you out for a day here or there, but you're able to manage things. But when you allow these things to continue progressing and you never address them, that's when they turn into, unfortunately, and it's, I mean, Ronnie's had so many surgeries and things like that. I mean, obviously hindsight's twenty twenty, but I truly believe based on listening to his conversations before that if someone was there to teach Ronnie how to properly manage his back issues when they did occur way back in the day, he would be a completely different uh, in a completely different situation than he is nowadays because surgeries are, are not a final fix. Sure, they can be helpful in some situations, but they should be our last resort. And we should completely exhaust conservative measures with a correct approach uh, of understanding movement first before we ever go into that realm. Absolutely, yeah. Like yourself, I'm not 100%. I can't uh, remember everything, but I know he did have a ton of surgeries on it. But you mentioned there as well, properly managing the athlete. You yourself are a former uh, pro athlete. 2011 games, was it? Uh, oh, I just went to um, the... Um, Nationals. 20, the, yeah, 2000 and... Uh, gosh, what was it? 2015, 2011 now? Yeah, U.S. Nationals. I'm trying to remember when it was now. Thinking how many <laughs> back then. Yeah, it would have been 2011 because it would have been my my second year of grad school. Yeah, 2011 U.S. Nationals. Yeah, and then... Um, yeah, so you've got your own background as uh, an athlete rebuilding milo the book that you just released i want to say about two three months ago now is it, it yep. new on the mm -hmm. uh, oh, a little bit longer there. um that also stems from rebuilding and properly managing an athlete mm -hmm. can you talk us a little bit about what that's about and what went into that and yeah. again touch on just why it's so important to pick up these things when they're little and keep them little small so rebuilding milo all stemmed from my idea of wanting to give as much education to the athlete and coach as possible i wanted there to be a guide almost a blueprint for the average everyday coach and athlete that you know one day you're having you pain while squatting well, you don't have a good physio that lives nearby. You don't want to scroll through a thousand YouTube videos. You open this book, you go to the knee pain chapter. You learn about knee pain. You learn how it occurs from a movement-based perspective. You understand load tolerance over time and movement problems. And you understand, you know, here's all the different ways in which your doctor would explain it. They call it patellofemoral joint pain or IT band syndrome. But you don't have to be a medical professional to understand and take the first steps to fix why your issue started. So it gives you very simple tests and measures, same ones I use in clinic, to be able to uncover the movement issues and take the first steps to addressing them with corrective exercises, to be able to get out of pain and rebuild your body back to being able to do what you love to do, which is lift weights. So I went through a number of different parts of the body, low back, hip, knee, ankle, uh, shoulder, elbow, 
Um, and there'll be future additional chapters that touch on the foot and things like that. Um, and even the last one was why the last chapter was why we uh, shouldn't ice as much as we we do right now as professionals. Um, and that may be a mind blowing thing to a lot of people out there, specifically physios. Um, and it was the idea of just trying to empower athletes and coaches with the understanding of what we have as professionals, but speak to a way in which they understand them. You know, if only they had this information prior to uh, sustaining a big injury, they maybe would have been able to keep it at bay. And it's it's time and time again, I talk with athletes that are like, I just have, I've been dealing with this for so many weeks, I just don't know what to do. And I go to a physical therapist and they tell me, we'll just stop squatting. I go to a doctor, they just tell me, stop, stop squatting so much and take this ibuprofen. And that can't be the final fix. You know, they, they're searching for someone that's actually going to speak to them in a language that they understand and understand their, their ultimate goals that they love lifting. And unfortunately, there's not enough medical practitioners nowadays that speak that language, that talk to the athlete and understand their desires and what they love to do. You mentioned a couple of things there. The doctor that says, just stop it or pop a pill. That really, really grinds my gears because it doesn't solve anything. Um, but more importantly, you mentioned uh, to not use ice uh, as much as we do now. Um, I don't know where you stand on it, but if I'm going to use ice, uh, my recommendation now is, or at least the way I use it, is not so much for inflammation, but just as uh, pain numbing. Um, mm -hmm. And then seeing how things develop from there. What is it you are using it for or advocating not using it for? Um, yeah, what, what was that about? I'll tell you, I have not used ice in clinic in probably three to four years now. So, and I treat 40 hours a week. I don't use ice anymore. I, I would say if you slam your finger in a car door and you're just in immense pain, sure, use some ice for a little bit, for sure. But if you can manage it and you can find positions where you feel okay, don't use ice because it's going to hinder the healing process. It's going to slow the inflammatory process, which is what you need. If there's not inflammation, you do not have optimal healing. And time and time again, there's a number, if you actually look at the research, and I, I really, really recommend you know anyone listening to this to actually look at the research of what it says. Um, there's not any research articles that show that ice actually promotes faster healing at all. It, the only thing it does is it's, it delays pain signals to the brain. So if you're looking for a quick, you know, get a little bit of pain modulation, sure. It's not, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying don't ever ice. If you're in 10 out of 10 pain, throw some ice on it. That's why we have it. But if you can find a good position, if you, if your back is killing you, but you can lay on your back and all of a sudden you feel relief or you can take a 10 minute walk and you're feeling much better. But the second you sit down, it hurts. Well, let's stand up. Let's continue walking. Let's stay moving. Movement is medicine. And I think too often we just throw some ice on it and think that we're healing it. In fact, we're actually slowing the healing process. The interesting thing is that most people don't even realize, um, especially I would assume that most people listening to this are probably more of that physio mindset, right? The, the idea uh, behind ice originally, especially in our profession, uh, was from the original uh, sports medicine book it coined in 1979 by Dr. Gabe Merkin, in which he used the term rice, rest ice, uh, compression, compression elevation. elevation. Well, what most people don't realize is that Dr. Gabe Merkin actually came out and I believe it was like 2013 and recanted his statement and said, I was wrong about icing. Icing actually delays the healing process. And most people don't realize that because it hasn't been just, you know, thrown in our faces yet for such a long time. Ice is something that we have used to uh, be our first line of defense if someone hurts. And I mean, hey, I treated this way too, like coming out of school. Someone came to me with shoulder pain. I assessed them. We went through exercises. And before they left, hey, let's get some ice on your shoulder for about 10 minutes. You'll be feeling much better before you leave. I don't do that anymore. And my patients are doing just fine. Like so many people are like, oh, don't take my ice away. No, educate, teach the patient that they don't need ice. If you do a good job as a physical therapist and physio at promoting proper movement in doing the things that you should be doing you don't need ice nearly as much as you think you need to okay yeah um, i haven't used it in clinic uh normally on the sideline um if i'm physioing for matches and stuff if someone's gone through their ankle or something but um last few questions now uh what is it that you think that, that you're doing differently with your patients 
with your clients that helps you get these results what is it about your approach do you think that that separates you out from uh yeah joe blogs down the road I think the big thing is I just take a movement based approach and I get people off the, the physio bed. I get people moving, you know, I think, uh, for too long, our profession has been a, let's do clamshells and sideline external rotations and little step ups and 25 pounds on the leg press because not many people are dealing with elite athletes. Let's be real. Most of the people that we deal with are general population. And while that works for some people, if you have very low capacity patients, that's not how life is lived. And especially that's not how life is lived if you're an athlete. And I think the big thing is understanding <clears throat> that there's a time and a place for low level exercises, but we need to get people up. We need to get them moving. Obviously within pain-free motions, I'm not trying to push someone into squatting 200 pounds and that, you know, push through pain. Obviously that wouldn't, you know, make them worse. But I think the big thing is I get people up and I get them moving and I challenge them in the same way and would uh, with a workout, but I do so in a way that's obviously not painful and improving their capacity and working on their mechanics. For example, I, I see a lot of patients uh, who are post-op ACL and sometimes I'll get patients that have gone to other clinics for a while and they will come to me <clears throat> near the end of their treatment. They're like, all right, well, it's time for some more sports specific work. And I'll be like, all right, well, show me your single leg squat. <clears throat> and they'll be like, my single leg squat. I was like, your PT did single leg squats with you, right? <clears throat> They're like, oh no. I mean, we did leg press. We did some double leg squats with a, you know, 12 kilo kettlebell, but that's it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm like, they didn't do any challenging work with you to see you squat on one leg or, you know, do some, a, a deadlift or a squat or, you know, improve your capacity that way. And so I sort of have to start rebuilding them from stage one. I think probably a lot of it has to stem from a lot of physios that enter the field were athletes at one time, but they didn't continue to do so. So they sort of left that world behind and then entered the physio world and they were taught these basic exercises, but they sort of forgot about how to train athletes, how to train for capacity and strength to where I sort of was that still competitive weightlifter for years when I first started practicing. So it was easy for me to integrate a lot of these practices that I saw in real time with weight training as a coach and as an athlete that I were, I was putting into my practice. And I was like, these patients are doing so much better. I'm teaching them. I'm teaching like, you know, I had a 90 year old lady. I was teaching her a single leg squat off a six inch box. Nice. Cause what is that? That's walking downstairs. You know, a lot of people are like, Oh, I would never do that with a patient. Well, what is deadlifting? If I can teach someone how to deadlift with correct technique with a 40 pound kettlebell off the ground, that's picking up a box in their garage. You know, it's, it's, it, it's improving technical capacity to be able to use the appropriate mechanics that we're looking to see in real life. Again, understanding that if I can improve someone's positional capacity, it enhances their ability to have more leeway when there's less load. So, if they do have to bend over to pick up their grandchild and their backgrounds a little bit, well, that kid doesn't weigh much. So they're going to have more capacity to do so with less risk of injury in the future. Not saying they have to hinge down and brace their core really hard to pick up an eight pound kid, yeah. but the more capacity we can build in clinic and teach them how to move well with more load, the better they'll be able to function as a human outside. So I think th those are sort of the big things that, uh, I think I, I started doing a little bit differently and I I'm loving seeing more and more physios in the world's uh, touch on weight training mechanics, because I think long-term we're just going to be in a better place. Ah, absolutely. I was going to say it baffles me that uh, you had an ACL patient come to you who at their previous physio wasn't doing one leg stuff, but then I thought about it and I've actually seen a couple of those myself. I feel probably it, I was a bit spoiled in the clinic that I first started uh, working at in that I saw a lot of that uh, post-op ACL, total knee or post-op a lot and also a lot of complex injuries, operations and stuff and my mentors that I was working with, they're absolutely fantastic physios mm -hmm. and a couple of times we picked them up and um, I'd be working on them alongside my mentor we'd sort of split the load with that patient i'd see them uh once or twice a week he'd see them once a week just to keep an eye and make sure things are turning over when i first started and, and to help build me up 
And one of the patients that we got in was someone who was five, six months down the line, had already been running, never done a single leg squat, and uh, on their single leg leg press could only do about 30 kilo comfortably. Um, I don't know what 30 kilos is in pounds, probably creeping around 60, yeah, 60, yeah. Um, And that's not a lot if you're 70, 80 kilo yourself. Um, Mm -hmm. And if you're running, that's really not sufficient. And uh, it, it was a bit of a gentle conversation with them to say, listen, we know you've already been running, but we're going to have to pull you back, lad. We're going to have to slow things down a bit for you because mm-hmm. we don't want to have this going the wrong way. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that we cover with the online course as well, uh, with the course we got from Bart Dingen and the fact that unilateral work is so important for Agreed. for your, whether you're an athlete or not, whether you're someone who wants to get back to sport or not. If you, hurt you if you tore your meniscus when you were out on winter sport with the kids or whatever unilateral work is so it it baffles the mind to think that there are physios out there that aren't aren't doing it that aren't implementing i mean as as humans we're not always on two feet you know i mean sure a power lifter is on two feet when they squat but let me tell you the amount of power lifters i get that have knee pain hip pain back pain and i ask them to do a single leg squat and they fail because they never use that style of training. You know, again, it all comes down to movement. Squat is first and foremost of movement, but it's not only done on two legs, it's also done on one leg. And you need to have that capacity. Now, I'm not saying everyone needs to do a a pistol squat because there's a lot that goes into it, but you should be doing some unilateral training. We live a life of unilateral. You're walking up and down stairs, you're walking forward. You're not on two legs doing a squat all day long. So I think it's it's a must to be able to do some single leg training just for life yeah absolutely and what three tips would you give to someone working in the field uh, to help up their game i would uh definitely recommend them just to continue finding people within the field that they love to learn from and read everything that they have from them so for example like Stuart mcgill i read all of his books um shirley sarman i read all of her stuff mike reynolds got great stuff i read all of his stuff immerse yourself in the field of understanding the giants who have come before you read all their stuff yes i mean continue the research but read the books that they have written because there's so much knowledge in there and just soak up how they do things and get because what you do is you gleam context and wisdom that doesn't always come out just in reading a research article and people love to read the research articles there's nothing wrong with that i've read so much research but i think just getting the wisdom that you get in the context from uh, a lot of the books that people have written is just amazing Um, that's the first one the second one never stop learning find something new every single day to continue reading a new research article a different part of the body read everything from it you find a research article you like read all the different research articles that they cited and they'll then go read those. Um, I can't tell you the amount of research I have printed off on every single part of the body. Um, and I try to cite a lot of those in rebuilding Milo. So anyone that has rebuilding Milo, yes, it's written for the strength athlete and coach, but you know, I tried to write it and base a lot of it on research so that the strength and conditioning nerd or the physio can actually go through and read all the different articles uh, to see where where the hell I got the this, this science from. So I think in the back chapter alone, there's 140 something, uh, you know, cited research articles so people can really see where the, where the science is coming from. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's one of the things that Jill Cook said as well when we had her on the podcast. She goes, mm-hmm. listen, your research articles are great, but also pick up some of the books. Because with the research articles, we can literally just talk about the research. With the books, you also get more context around what we were doing and why we were doing it. And you get more of the thinking around it. Exactly. And I love Jill. I had her on my own podcast. She was amazing to speak to. But And again, yeah. it's it's understanding the context and, and the wisdom from it. Just like we talked about before, if you only read a research article and saw, well, there's 25 degrees of spinal flexion, well, then spinal flexion is inevitable and it's, it's not a bad thing. Well, let's understand, well, how many of those people were trained people in kettlebell movements and how, how uh, appropriate was the movement for every single person? Understanding the training cues and things like that is so important. Yeah. Any other tips? 
man, I think those are the big ones. Just continue learning and trying to learn from the, the, uh, the big people who us. have come before us. I think that's the biggest thing. I always say I'm, I'm only where the, the line, I'm only a dwarf sitting on the, the shoulders of giants who have come before me. Every time I hear that, I think of uh, Graham Hancock, who's also a Joe Rogan guest quite often. I don't yeah. know if you feel, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Every time I hear that, I can't help but think of him. Ah, oh, man, look, uh, any other last little bits that you want to leave for the listeners? Man, I just want to say thank you for having me on. It's been a great chat. Absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you. Thank you so much for, mm-hmm. for giving us your time. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, Aaron. Well, ladies and gents, thanks again for listening in and we'll catch you next time. As always, wherever you're listening to this, we appreciate your time. And if you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to get in contact and let us know. Until next time. Peace.